Good morning, good afternoon, or good night, depending on what time you may be checking out this audio or video version of AuroraCast. Welcome to episode three of season two. I do hope you guys are keeping well. And in this solo podcast, we're going to be deep diving and taking a look at and talking about Dolby Atmos, which is something I'm really, really excited about. And I think you should be too. I think if you're in any field of media production, if you're working as a composer, if you're working as a musician, if you're working on video games, if you're working on documentaries, animations, anything, apps um, that contains audio, um, you should be thinking about Dolby Atmos. Apple have just made it part of Logic Pro X in what they're branding spatial audio. Um, Pro Tools is a little bit more complicated because you need to get the Dolby render engine, which is a paid product, I'm afraid. Um, but it is in Ableton. It is slowly going into all the DAWs or the digital audio workstations. Um, and we can now mix in surround sound from our homes with headphones. Um, you no longer need these kind of... Um, well, I don't want to say you no longer need them because they've definitely got a place, especially for feature film, um, things like that. They're going to be played back in a big space. Um, but generally speaking, you can mix surround sound in your room. Um, you don't need to spend thousands and thousands of pounds like you, you used to only a few years ago um, on a whole bunch of speakers, a whole bunch of amplifiers. Um, and not even that mentioning that, just having the space itself um, in order to set that room up so this is something that's very very cool and i think that while it's not necessarily being spoken about sort of in the mainstream the capabilities are there and i think as time progresses and this, these sound bars and you know the iphones and the android phones and the games consoles and everything else just keeps pushing this sound forward I think as people go to more and more Dolby screens um, in the cinema, they experience Dolby Atmos sound and the mixing and the mastering of this sound becomes more immersive. I think people are going to start to cotton on to, oh, wow, what is this? You know, how has this come about? So it's one of those things that, you know, obviously if you're just coming to, say, creating music, sure, you need to look at actually mastering a stereo mix, <laughs> you know, before you start jumping in to worry too much about... Um, you know, musical beds and musical and an object, so to speak, um, in, in Dolby Atmos talk and just, you know, 5.1, 7.1, you know, or 9.1 or uh, something we'll come on to talk about, which is 7.1.4. So don't worry about these terminologies right now because we're going to get into it during this podcast. But yeah, in my mind, this is jumping almost, I think it's going to be as big as when we move from monophonic sound to stereophonic sound. You know, there's still people out there who love those kind of like, um, there's a Beatles box that you can buy that's still in mono. Um, you know, certain elements were lost when they stereophonic it, so to speak, when they put it into into stereo. But um, that was a massive jump when we went mono to stereo to quad to 5.1 to 7.1. Um, really what, what Dolby's done um, or Dolby Labs have done is they've, they've extended the capabilities of our 5.1 and our 7.1 um surround systems and they've added height channels um and they've added what's known as objects which can be essentially panned around a room in in clusters of speakers so if we take this if we take this down a second right because you can even have 2.1 2.1 would be two stereo speakers with one subwoofer so the point one in that capacity is talking about a subwoofer right if you think of a 5.1 system that would be front left center front right rear left rear right one subwoofer if you looked at 7.1 that would be front left center front right then you'd have like a, a side right rear right rear left and um side left so that's your kind of 7.1 right um when we talk about um dolby atmos it tends to be a 9.1 um, so you've now got nine speakers around you, right? So you've got in the same configuration as say your five one, which would be what we call a music bed. So like you literally can pan a sound to each one of those individual speakers, but then they've got channels above you as well, right? So when we talk of 7.1.4, which is something you could have in your home, what we're talking about now is you've got seven speakers, say, on the ground, 
you've got one subwoofer and then you've got four speakers in the ceiling and those four speakers in the ceiling are essentially your height so we'll we'll dive back into this again but they've basically created a algorithmic system um, which can go up to 128 audio channels so that's 128 discrete audio channels right separate channels that can then be clustered using kind of metadata for panning um, and automated around you so it's almost split into two sections you've got what they call musical beds and a bed would literally be panned to those speakers that are say on the ground but then they've got speakers above in height and they can pan what they then call objects around the room so it gives you this sort of almost three-dimensional um experience so to speak um it's uh it's quite a thing that i'm really kind of like i say i'm uh, i'm jumping on so given we just had the um 10 year anniversary of brave um i do love um brave very very good film um i suppose my uh, my scottish roots are uh, coming back there so to speak um i did love that film and uh, it dawned on me when i saw that 10 year anniversary pop up that that was the first time that dolby atmos was almost demoed so the first dolby atmos, atmos um installation so to speak was at the El Capitan Theatre in Los Angeles for the premiere of Brave, and that was June 2012, so 10 years ago. So I'd love to hear if any people were at that premiere. I was definitely not in Los Angeles watching Brave at that time, and I was not aware of uh, Dolby Atmos at that time. So um, that's cool. If you were there, I'd love to to hear about that. Um, interestingly, the first when we look at kind of the first mediums or the first types of show... Um, that kind of started using or integrated Atmos um, as part of their productions. TV was Power Season 3. Did not know that. Um, Game of Thrones, so they they upmixed their 7.1, I suppose, to 9.1, um, so Atmos, for their Blu-ray versions of Game of Thrones. So when we say upmixed, it wasn't necessarily designed to be, you know, auditioned in that format but what they would have done is just bled elements into those those other speak those other two um musical beds so to speak so i don't think there was any objects in game of thrones um anything actually moving in terms of height but i could be wrong um music wise was rem's automatic for the people for their 25th anniversary and then when we jump into kind of um film it would have been transformers age of extinction the Blu-ray version of that was mixed in Atmos. Games, um, Star Wars Battlefront, Overwatch, Battlefield 1, Gears of War 4. So that's on Xbox and PC um, and PlayStation 4, I gather, uh, you know, respectfully. Um, and, you know, I, I I really didn't know that. I mean, I watched Power Season 3, you know, I watched Game of Thrones. You know, I'm not a huge REM fan, but I didn't know, you know, I'm a big enough fan that you would have thought I would have known that that went out in Atmos, but I didn't. Um, so this tech has been around for a while, but not that long. And it's just been sort of submerged, right? It's just been sort of um, in the background, so to speak. You know, and I started kind of seeing it pop up in Apple Music. So if we talk about Apple Music, they launched it in 2021, um, kind of alongside their AirPods Pro um, things like that. It was actually Tidal in 2019 who first sort of brought this this out, so to speak. Now it's available almost everywhere. Um, I think Spotify is still lagging behind a little bit, but us as music producers, you know, um, we can put our Atmos or spatial mixes out. Um, DistroKid, um, Ditto, all these distribution platforms are allowing you to do it so you can submit your spatial mix to the services. So why not do it? You know, um, there is an element of reliance still on the consumer um, to have a Dolby Atmos enabled device, but I'm finding it's everywhere. It's in iPhones, Android phones, it's in tablets, it's in laptops. Um, I bought this TV, which I know you can't see because I've gone for this kind of dark, um, you know, um, uh, grading on my uh, on my episode because uh, I'm just experimenting with my new camera, um, but that was a like 300 pound TV. You know, it's got Dolby Atmos in it, and I think people are sort of subconsciously seeing Dolby more. You know, we're seeing um, Odeon, for instance, have got their Dolby screens, which is then using sort of Dolby projectors. Um, 
with Dolby Vision, you know, which is a, their own version of kind of Ultra HD, right? Um, you know, so Dolby really, are, in my opinion, have been unsung heroes for for many, 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 many years. You know, they're, they're denoising even when it came to quadraphonic sounds when we basically took the stereo um, field, if you like, or the, the stereo waveform, which would have run alongside the optical tape on a projector, denoised it <laughs> to get more dynamic range out of it, and then quadded it, so through an algorithm to the back of the the auditorium, so to speak, a little bit of reverb, a little bit of delay, um, which was done through their processes, through their algorithms, and that gave us quadraphonic sound, which then developed into ProLogic, you know, which again was an algorithm of 5.1, ProLogic 2, 7.1. Uh, 7, um, and, you know, some of, the, some of the cinemas now, you know, 49, 50 speakers, you know, four subwoofers, um, and like I say, you've got this this capability now where through their processes, you've got these 128 channels and you can pan, you know, I think 118 of them are left for objects. So when we talk about objects, this is what I'm saying that when it was first described to me, you know, on sort of the most basic term, it's almost like think of a joypad, right? You've got a joypad and you can just move a sound around the room. It's kind of what it is um, in many ways. If you look at if you are a Logic Pro X user and you've got the latest version, um, there's a, a little Nas X demo in Spatial and you can see how these objects are moving. Um, or just, just YouTube a video um, of someone mixing in Atmos to see how this process um, kind of works. You know, um, I think for games, which is something I'm really focused on at the moment, they've got a whole, what they're calling um, ISF. So that's um, uh, Intermediate Spatial Format. And that supports 20, uh, sorry, 32 active objects for a 714 bed. So again, when we talk 714, if you picture your front room, say, you would literally have seven speakers around you, four in the ceiling, one subwoofer. Not unachievable. You know, I'm in a very small space right now and I've got a 5.1 system, a Yamaha ProLogic 1 system, which is still running a little bit of... Uh, audio digital, digital audio um sorry ad converters uh, going on there to get that working but yeah it's still running um so yeah that's something that that is really cool you know that that leaves you with from the information i'm looking at here that's 20 additional dynamic objects that can be active um in a like i say 741 um uh configuration um obviously theaters are going to benefit, I suppose, for this for, from this the most because they've got the space. They can blast out that amount of loud sound and they've got literally the room to do it. Um, but I'm interested in where we're going with this, you know, um, from a consumer standpoint as well. You know, you've got Denon, Marantz, Pioneer, Yamaha, um, Apple Music, Tidal, Spotify will catch up, you know, HBO, um, Disney Plus, Netflix, um, all these services are Atmos capable, right? You know, um, you've got people who've got the AirPods or the AirPods Pro, which are which are Atmos enabled, you know, um, or the device is Atmos enabled. And this is something that I really need to kind of delve into because I've seen Dolby demos of this where it's working just on any set of headphones, you know, so it's almost using that kind of binaural um technology which we've known about for a long time you know um um psychoacoustics is not a new field of study but what i'm interested in is what does this mean coming into a world with kind of the metaverse and, and vr and augmented reality i watched um the um joe rogan experience podcast with mark zuckerberg where he was very much talking about the and, and not within a sort of uh, ridiculous time frame as well. You know, we're talking within the next five years, you being able to almost play a poker game, you know, and your friend isn't actually there. Or I could be doing a podcast and someone's here as a hologram, right? They're not actually with me. Now, I don't know what I think about that right now. I'm kind of on the on the sort of um, devilry. <laughs> I'm on the devilry um, um, sort of mindset when it comes to that. Because I, I feel like it's kind of like I like people and I want to try and keep people in the same room communicating, fist bumps, hugs, all that stuff, right? I don't want all my friends suddenly as holograms sitting in my flat and we never go out and we never talk to each other. Whether things will go like that, I don't know. But I've just got a little personal kind of um, 
caveat fear, I suppose, um, about what that would mean. Um, but let's see, right? We can't get away from it. This is going to be happening. So my kind of um, viewpoint or my interest right now is what does this mean if you've got a VR headset on or even a pair of glasses, which is what Zuckerberg was talking about, and then you've got some sort of, you know, th this Atmos sounds only going to keep getting better and better, right? So if you've then got a headset or a, or something on your head or even you're in a room, right, there's, there's Atmos configured, you really are going to be in this kind of immersive space, you know, and, and anything's possible, I think, in that, in that kind of environment um, to really get that kind of... I mean, if you guys haven't seen a film in Atmos or listened to something that's truly been mixed in Atmos, Hans Zimmer's Dune is a good example. Um, I always say, people always pull me up on this, it's Dune or Dune. You know, I think it's Dune. I think I no, sorry, I think I say Dune and it's Dune because people look at me like I'm I'm crazy when I say that. But you know, that there's a sketchbook score that was mixed in spatial. Um, I believe that Zimmer was given a set of those headphones, those AirPods Pro, early. Um, and he was given access to the kind of spatial mixing engine that, that Apple were developing alongside Dolby. So, yeah, the sketchbook of, of, of that score is done in spatial. Um, and there are, I think, classical music's a good thing to listen to, um, where they're starting to kind of almost mic up concert halls with Atmos in mind. And it really does feel like you're sitting in the concert hall. Um, do I want to hear ACDC's Back in Black in spatial? Personally, probably not. Um, I don't think that that's something that, in my view, would work. I think it would potentially work if it was like a stadium live performance of the album. But I think while I'm kind of very interested in this this concept and where this is going to lead us and what it means for us across the board as creators, there's definitely a space still for stereo mixes in the same way that there's still space for mono mixes right you know um again come back to come back to the, that beatles uh, box set i think there's going to be a ton of people in the electronic dance music scene who still want mono in clubs there's going to be producers who've been working in mono forever uh, for clubs i know stereo is basically in the clubs now um but there are talks of atmosing club spaces um again coming down to the consumer level you know i have seen kind of jbl soundbars where you've got a really powerful subwoofer um, or an LFE, as we call it, low frequency effects. Um, you've got then your soundbar, which has got your directional and height. And then there's two parts of the soundbar that, bar that disconnect. I'll, I'll link this in the description. But they disconnect and they're charged by battery and they sit behind you and you end up with directional both at you and firing up into the air and bouncing back down. So you end up with your kind of 9.1. Point four, um, in your front room, essentially. Now, is that going to be as good quality as going to the cinema? Probably not. But JBL are a decent brand, and I'll be very interested to hear what that does sound like. So we're kind of at this, um, we're kind of at this this crossroads, I think, in terms of both high end cinema auditorium tech and consumer level um, tech, which is in our homes. And also when we're out and about in the street, you know, when we're consuming our media um, outside of our homes, you know, um, I found it at the moment a little bit disorientating with the AirPods. I've got the the AirPods Pro, so I haven't, yeah, I haven't got the Max ones which go over your ear. I've got the ones that go in here and there's like a spatial tracked mode. Um, it was kind of cool when I was watching a film. I put a film on, um, like I think I was watching Blade Runner, tw yeah, Blade Runner 2049 and just sort of walking around my flat cleaning up or whatever else and i felt like well, you know whenever i moved the sound recontextualized itself to the scene if that makes sense so if i suddenly turned my head to one particular side it then felt it kept me attached to the screen which was a strange experience given that the scene that the scene is static on the tv right but again, if you think about this, if I was wearing a VR headset or if there's, again, coming back to that conversation with with Rogan, with Zuckerberg, where he was saying that he doesn't feel there's a need anymore to have a TV, you know, you could quite easily have the TV almost follow you around through glasses, right? You could, you don't have to have a physical box on the wall anymore. Um, 
again, potentially dodgy ground. You know, like, are we going to end up in a place where we don't own any physical possession? Perhaps it's a little bit out of the box way of thinking, but are we going to literally own nothing, nothing physical? You've just got like a bed, you know, and then you put your your augmented reality VR glasses on, right? And you're and your your high end spatial sound, and suddenly you're sort of walking through Egypt. You know, is that going to be our future? I don't know, but um, it's got a place, right? And it's something that I'm that I'm definitely interested in. So, you know, this is something that I'm going to continue exploring. Um, I'm yet to put an Atmos mix out there, but I will be doing it. Um, I'm kind of doing my experimentations at the moment in Logic Pro X purely because I'm being a little bit cheap and it's built into the software. So while I'm kind of finding my feet, um, again, exploring that kind of uh, musical beds and then objects, again, the beds, they can be panned in terms of they can go around you, right? But um, the object will also use height. So if you're if you're 914, just to reiterate how this works, your nine speakers would be, they wouldn't move. They, they just be around you at, at ear level, say, right? But then you're four on the ceiling. You've got the height, which works alongside the, the beds. So you can start panning an object around your head in terms of height. So you get that perception of a, of a sound becoming louder or quieter. Like this, basically. <laughs> for those of you, for those of you listening to the audio version, you, you probably think, "Was he? Was he doing?" I'm literally moving my hands from left to right at the side of my head, and then up and down um, from the top of my head to the ceiling. So that's the impression that the that the object will give you. Um, it's very very cool. So yeah, um, while I'm kind of experimenting with that myself, um, again, do open the Little Nas X um, track if you're a Logic Pro X user because it. A, just the way they've they've handled that vocal chain is quite a lesson in itself. It's interesting how all the volumes are quite low because there's so many channels, right? You've got to kind of almost keep... It's no longer about volume um, in terms of the mix, really. Um, well, it, it, what with luffs, which is something we'll come on to talk about in another podcast, I think the loudness wars are, are well and truly over um, for most of us. Um, but yeah, um, everything's quite low in the mix, um, there's lots of clarity and then it texturally builds. So yeah, just the, the leveling, um, and the, the approach to the vocal bus in itself is, is a lesson. And then just hearing what they've done and looking at that kind of, um, renderer, um, the Dolby renderer, so to speak, which is where you can then visually see these, these objects moving, um, is really cool. Um, I'd like to do it in Pro Tools just because my workflow for anyone who knows me, tends to focus more in Pro Tools. That being said, this is the first time I'm going to be approaching doing any of this sort of mixing. So it may actually be that we end up staying in Logic. Um, the future will will come to uh, to tell. Um, Ableton as well. I've been really impressed with Ableton. I've seen some, some um, live installations at the University of Northampton where I teach um, in Surround, which is a very, very cool concept. So I'm quite interested in that kind of live... Um, interaction as well and i know that when atmos comes to live ableton live it'll be interesting to see if we can extrapolate or if i can see how how that could be extrapolated from the kind of 91 to 914 and see what the guys can come up with there so um yeah i'm going to end that now uh, here i just wanted to give you guys a kind of intro to atmos i hope it's made sense um obviously i've lived in Surrounds. So I've been very, very fascinated by by immersive sound for probably thirty years. Um, so um, I've always tended to listen to music in surround. I've always had a surround sound system or access to a surround sound system everywhere I've lived. So for me, I kind of understand this concept, and I've set those systems up multiple times and EQ'd the room and looked at delays and placed speakers where they might work best or might you know. I've done this kind of thing. Um, I've worked in cinemas um, as, in terms of sound and projection. I've I've talked to those guys. I've seen those systems being set up. I've heard I've heard it when they've gone wrong. You know, um, not so much in an Atmos. Um, and I tell that I have a I have had an experience with a, a far right speaker which was down in an Atmos setup, and to, to me it was notice, noticeable noticeable um, 
when those when those um objects just weren't as as sort of um precise and clear so um so yeah i'll leave you guys with that now any questions please do uh, let me know um a little bit of kind of a podcast spiel please do um please do rate the podcast on apple podcasts obviously subscribe to the youtube channel please do share uh, the podcast as i as i grow this um, if you'd like to contribute to help me kind of keep the lights on, so to speak, head over to www.patreon.com slash mwbellmusic. And I hope to see you guys in the next episode where we continue down this ever exciting journey of music and sound production. Mike out.